As we close our sermon series on 2020 vision, we want to turn to Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, to chapter 13. So hear now these words as Paul seeks to talk and share about a more excellent way. You may follow along on the screen, and there's also a sermon outline in your bulletin. Paul writes, If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body, so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. And when I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. And let's be in prayer together. O oh Lord, by your grace, help us to see that of faith, hope, and love, love is the greatest of these. Amen. This year promises to be a year of weddings and celebrations in the Kinsey household. <laughs> With two daughters preparing to be married in May and October, respectively, we are now in the throes of planning. <laughs> and to be sure, there is a great deal to be accomplished, not to mention to be paid. Indeed, I was reading, that's a good joke, wasn't it? <laughs> it's no joke, though. <laughs> I was reading the other day, though, about the cost of weddings in America. Depending on where you live, of course, a wedding can cost up to $35,000. And that's probably conservative. But even in Johnson County, a prime venue can cost no less than $4,000. Just ask us. We know. <laughs> now, I don't know where I read this comment or this phrase, but someone has coined the term wedding industrial complex. The wedding industrial complex. Things seem to have gotten out of hand when it comes to weddings. And... Uh, I can see why they shared that. Now, I mentioned this here at the beginning of the sermon to note what one New Testament scholar has written about our passage today. We need to rescue 1 Corinthians 13 from the popular piety associated with flowers and kisses 
and the clothing wear of America's wedding culture. Such images, you see, are far removed from Paul's original concerns in this letter. That's one reason we need to rescue the letter. But a second reason we need to rescue this passage is related to the first concern. We need to rescue this passage from romantic sentimentalism. Romantic sentimentalism. When Paul writes to the Corinthians about love, he's not writing about two people gushing with warm feelings toward one another. As theologian Stanley Hauerwas of Duke Divinity School has written, such a notion of love is actually the enemy of the gospel. So much of what we hear, he says, about love in churches is simply sentimental drivel as it's not related to the cross. A third reason we need to rescue 1 Corinthians 13 is the very word love itself, which in English cannot quite capture the full range of meaning to the word. In fact, leave it to New York Life Insurance to resurrect the complexity of the word love during the Super Bowl, which offered the wisdom, actually, of the famous Christian writer C.S. Lewis. Did you see the ad? The title of the commercial is Love Takes Action, and it guides viewers through the four definitions of love. The commercial was a hit and those who stop to watch it realize that there are four ways of understanding love. And using C.S. Lewis as a guide, the ad narrates and describes love as philia, or the affection that grows with friendship. And then there's storge, the love for a loved one or a grandparent, let us say. And then there's eros, this uncontrollable urge to say to someone, I love you. And then there's agape, which is love in action or love as an action. And the fourth kind of love, the commercial says, is the most admirable. Agape is love in action. It takes courage. It takes strength. It's sacrifice. In the words of C.S. Lewis, this is the love that loves God with one's whole heart and those around us, putting them first. Unlike languages like Latin and Greek and Hebrew, which have multiple words for love, English only has the one word. And so part of rescuing 1 Corinthians 13 is to understand this word agape because that's the word Paul's using is the word agape. Now whether this rescue operation is successful that's another story. How we hear a word is so often conditioned by our own environment. However, in Paul's original setting in Corinth, this word agape is connected to what Paul calls a more excellent way in which the members of the Corinthian church are called to treat one another with mutual regard and respect. And it's the key to comprehending this passage. As the previous 12 passages in the letter Paul's dealing with all kinds of problems in the Corinthian church. You see, he spent 18 months planting a new church in Corinth. And now Paul has gotten a letter from the Corinthians listing all these problems. And Paul takes time in 1 Corinthians to address each problem. And questions have arisen as to how to follow Jesus. And Paul seeks to confront these 
questions with wisdom and tact. And what Paul's doing in this passage, he's trying to lay out a way for the Corinthians to follow Christ. And it's one of the reasons we need to consider this passage more as a reprimand, perhaps, a kind of a test than a counsel for newlyweds, though that's important. Right, Genethy? She's, she's counseling our kids. <laughs> you see, at the heart of this squabble in the Corinthian church is the question of the use of spiritual gifts. And apparently some of the members of the church were using their gifts, notably the gift of speaking in tongues, in ways that were opposite of love, of agape. And they were flaunting their gifts. They were thinking their gifts were more important than others. And a kind of superiority complex had come into play. You see, this was happening at the Lord's Supper too, where the rich were telling the poor that they couldn't come. And then there were so-called super apostles, and they were supposed to be building up the church, but they were actually tearing down the church. And it leads Paul halfway through this letter to say, whoa, whoa, time out. Let's talk about another way of being the church, of sharing what it's about to be the body of Christ. And in one of the most beautiful passages in all of human literature, the Apostle Paul says simply and profoundly, here is what agape is, here is what love is, and here is what it's not. Because agape is patient. Agape is kind. Agape rejoices in the truth because it has this capacity to sort things out over time as it bears all things and believes all things. And especially when the going gets rough, it has this ability to hope, to endure, because its origin, you see, is in God. And that's why agape never ends. It never stops. It just keeps on giving. But agape is also not certain things. Agape is not envious. It's not boastful. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable. It's not resentful. It doesn't rub it in when other things go wrong. No, love is more than that. You see, like Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, which says, more with less, Paul's chapter 13 says, more with less. And in a world bombarded with words, I can't help but appreciate how Paul is trying to keep it simple. And the reason he's keeping it simple has to do with the way the members of the Corinthian church had not listened to Paul early on. They had forgotten what he had taught them about being the body of Christ, about using their gifts to build up the church. In fact, Paul says so in the chapter before this. He says, in the body of Christ, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. And the ear cannot say to the foot, I have no need of you. And the stronger members cannot push out the weaker members. And the rich cannot say to the poor, get out of here. They all must work together according to the criterion of agape. Now such a criterion doesn't mean that anything goes because that would refute what Paul is saying in the letter. He's confronting the Corinthians. Instead, he's saying, now wait a minute, let's take a step back and let's ask a question. Am I doing this for my own benefit or am I doing this for the welfare of the whole community? The German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer once asked this question too when he was training pastors in an underground seminary in Nazi Germany. Apparently there were seminarians who wanted to impose what they thought was important upon the whole seminary. And rather than discern what others in the seminary were also contributing and giving, Bonhoeffer said, no, wait a minute. 
if this is going to work, we have to be open to the gifts of everyone. In our context, I sometimes wonder about the whole influence of what some people are calling cancellation culture. Have you ever heard that phrase? It's new to me. It is this attitude we've adopted to cancel out what others are saying to the point that no one's left standing. And it runs quite contrary to what John Wesley used to teach. That though we may not think alike, let us at least love alike. And I can't help but think what my two grandfathers would think about what's happening in our society today. Because one was a devout Republican, (laughs) and one was a devout Democrat. And they didn't always agree with each other, but they certainly loved each other. Today, however, our language appears to be too divisive. Our single-mindedness too entrenched. The purity test too toxic. The villains and the vicar and the victors too pronounced. And forgotten are Paul's key points that in the Christian life, agape is to be the foundation, the very goal for living. You see, agape requires character formation. And as we noted earlier, love's not simply a feeling. Rather, love is a virtue that is both given to us by the Holy Spirit and learned in a community. And it's the gift that needs to be both received and cultivated together. It's why agape requires patience. Here I'm preaching to myself. You see, agape doesn't come down from the cross. Agape doesn't say, I'm out of here. It endures for the sake of forgiveness. It doesn't adopt secular tactics to keep score. It learns over time the virtue of forbearance, that is, going with each other together, and it requires maturity. And just to cut to the chase, agape means then we need to have a sense of humility. It means we don't know all things, and we can't see the whole picture, because in truth, we all see it. We can't see all that's happening or all that's going to happen. No one can. Because if we did, we would sound like a noisy gong clanging around. No, love as agape means we act with humility. We see with humble eyes through the cross. Another angle of vision, because truth be told, All of our vision is blurry. And due to my own imperfections and your own imperfections, we can't quite make out what we see all the time, especially when we look in a mirror. When I look in a mirror, is it someone I know? Is it really me? Or is it someone who thinks he has it all together? Or is it someone whose face I'm trying to see, but I never can quite make out who it is? Is it Jesus' face, or is it someone else's face? Humble eyes remind us that someday we all will see, but that right now, only dimly, only partially, Humble eyes remind us that the things we thought were most important in this life are really like child's play in comparison to what is to come. And that of the things we have wondered about in terms of faith and hope and love, love matters the most. Love is the greatest of these. Because love gives us the eyes to see. And it gives us the vision 
to be the body of Christ.